Hello my friends, Takuya here, and welcome back to another alternate history Hearts of Iron 4 video. At this point, I think that you all genuinely hate me. As I'm sure that you all are aware by now, the way things work here for these videos is that I take the top 5 most liked comments down in the comment section that are suggestions for the next video, and I put that into a poll for you all to determine what it is that we do next. So before you continue watching the video, make sure to go ahead and do that right now, and also like the comments that you think would be good suggestions, because we will, as I said, take the top 5 most liked, and we'll put that into a poll. But from last time, by a pretty overwhelming margin, the option that won is, what if Operation Unthinkable happened? This is why I said that you all hate me. For those of you who are not somehow aware of what exactly Operation Unthinkable is, Operation Unthinkable was the plan where, after World War II, when Germany surrendered, that, um, the fight was gonna continue. Basically, the idea was that, not Neville Chamberlain, but Winston Churchill, since we're choosing the 1939 scenario right here, that he, in 1945, wanted to be able to launch a strike, a preemptive surprise attack, into the Soviet Union and knock out their control of Eastern Europe. Europe. He may have kind of wanted to do this, or rather we should say that there was a plan to do this, but Operation Unthinkable, well, there, there is a key reason as to why the whole thing is named Operation Unthinkable. The idea was stupid. See, the whole thing was never a serious plan of, hey, we really need to do this. The idea was more of a thought experiment, a war plan of, what if we had to do this? What would happen if we did? And the result of that was essentially the general staff coming together at the United Kingdom and being like, hey, yeah, that ain't gonna fly, chief, that's not gonna work. The Allies had something along the lines of a hundred divisions over here in Europe. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union had double the amount of divisions, over double in fact, so they would have heavily outnumbered the Allies. Any victories, or rather I should say advantage, that the Allies would have had at the beginning of Operation Unthinkable would have been, well, good, initially, but very quickly dissipated as numbers would pretty much overwhelm them. In fact, yeah, I'm pulling it up here right now. Projected balance in Western Europe by Allied estimates, the 1st of July 1945. The Soviet has well over double, in fact it's almost triple the amount of infantry divisions, it has one and a half times the amount of armor divisions, it has almost double the amount of aircraft, even if they're not necessarily as good of aircraft of course, the only advantage that the Allies really have is strategic aircraft because we had way, way, way more bombers. Now, one can then make the argument that those bombers would actually be effective in the case that the Allies actually have nukes at the beginning of the conflict, which, you know, is pretty nice. But the use of a nuclear weapon after, you know, not being at war with the Soviet Union for a long time, it being as part of a surprise attack, and which would most certainly result in a war of total annihilation, was kind of an unthinkable option for a lot of people, hence again the name. As a result, we can say that an allied attack upon the Soviet Union is essentially impossible, and the scenario that we would have to build in order to make that happen is much less likely, at least if everything follows the exact historical time that they did in our own timeline. The other thing to consider here with the Soviet Union is that actually there is one more idea that was also called Operation Unthinkable, and that was that after the initial idea of an allied attack upon the Soviet Union was dismissed, another thought experiment was put forth by Churchill and his war, not war cabinet, general staff, that's the term, of how would the UK be able to respond in a defensive war against the Soviet Union if the Soviets just decided to, I don't know, keep pushing west. Between the two scenarios, this one is arguably the more likely one. As the UK really would have been the only power here in Europe to actually be able to hold things, because by the time that, you know, May of 1945 was coming around and Germany had surrendered, the Americans were already pulling out a large amount of their divisions from Europe in order to be able to potentially launch an invasion here into Japan. This was the whole Operation Downfall aspect. As such, it would kind of make sense if the Soviet Union went and launched an attack. Maybe. In fact, you know what, before it is that I continue with the video right here, I'm gonna go ahead and post a secondary poll now to the page to see if people want an offensive or a defensive scenario, and then we're just gonna try to roll with that, because either one is the operation. I know I'm making this in post, but you all will get to see what the decision is after the fact, I guess. Okay, could this shift? Yes, possibly, but chances are unlikely. Overwhelmingly, you all want the offensive one, okay. So in order to explain that, we're not gonna be playing as the Soviet Union. No, that means we are gonna be needing to play as the United Kingdom. And so in order for that to happen then, a number of things are going to need to change. Yes, I'm going back to 1936, despite the fact that all this that I'm talking about takes place in 1945. I know, I know, but we have to, a lot has to change in order to make Operation Unthinkable maybe kind of technically possible. 
operation thing name. Yeah. There's a key reason that we're starting off things here in 1936, and that is because we need the UK to be stronger, but not necessarily too much stronger here, I guess. Why, you may wonder? Because we can't have the war go until 1945. Yeah, I know, I know. It, it, it's gonna sound crazy, but please hear me out on this. The problem with the whole thing with Operation Unthinkable is that the reason it is unthinkable is that by 1945, any efforts for the British to try and spearhead some kind of assault upon the Soviet Union is insane. It is really insane because the state for Britain at that point was bankrupt. They had lost hundreds of thousands of men. The population was exhausted after the war and didn't want to fight. And by that logic, also, you could say so too did the Soviets. The Soviets didn't want the same thing. But the British Empire was in no way, shape, or form prepared to act actually do some kind of operation like that. As such, at least for a while, we're going to have to assume that the war actually goes better for the British than it did in our own timeline, but then also simultaneously not so good that they don't end up having to, you know, w wait until later. I, I don't know. We're, we're gonna have to figure this thing out as we kind of play it out. To that end, it means no additional factories, no additional anything that the UK is going to have. We could theoretically assume that they maybe have one or two more mills from just like slightly earlier rearmament or something. You could say that. But in reality, it's not much. To that end, let's see, rifles, tanks, yeah, we're gonna need all this kind of basic stuff here from the very get-go. And we're gonna need to flush things out here with the Royal Navy and go ahead and get that finished. The thing that one has to understand about World War II, when we're going through all of this, is that the British Empire really fought a heroic effort over the course of the conflict. Both England itself and also simultaneously all of its varying different countries and colonies under it, yes. I think if I remember the statistic correct, something like one in seven of the entire population of Australia served over the course of that war. Like, it's, in, it's a really insane statistic when you look at it. But that is the reality. If Britain is actually going to stand a better chance against the Axis, and also from that logic, the Communists, the only real answer to do from the very beginning is limited rearmament. The recent stirrings from Germany and other fascist powers around the world suggest that we may not enjoy peace in our time. In preparation, we should begin to set the pieces in motion for our own rearmament as the situation get worse. British forces overall are quite small and pitiful, especially from the very beginning of the game. This is something that is going to need to be worked on a lot. Like, the only argument that we're really going to make here from the very beginning, right here with limited rearmament, is that specifically, from the beginning of the game, the UK is going to have access to early mobilization, just the very bare beginning. It's a big difference, actually, when all things are considered, because it means the population at this point is going to be slightly more prepared for things than they were in our own time. From that, we will say that the United Kingdom was more prepared for the conflict than they were in our own time. Request from Ethiopia. The Ethiopian ambassador has approached the government with a formal request from Haile Selassie to be allowed to set up a temporary government in exile here in the UK. Yes they are welcome here. At this point, pretty much everything is going to proceed as it did historically. We're not going to be changing anything. We're not going to be doing anything such as stopping the remilitarization re re of the Rhineland. Oh my god, why can I not speak? We're not going to be stopping the annexing of Czechoslovakia. We're not going to be doing any of this stuff. Literally every kind of thing is going to proceed as normal, albeit with some things being better for the British. Maybe more men, a little bit more development, a little more of everything. Smarter moves when war actually breaks out. Because if the UK is going to do anything at this time, it is going to reinforce the empire in order to make sure that it is stronger. Our empire is vast and despite our power weakly defended. To combat this, we need to encourage imperial patriotism throughout the realm. Now, in this new timeline, does that mean that we're going to pursue a path of global defense? No. We are actually going to be still following basically the same historical timeline. Literally just with a little bit more preparation on UK's part and perhaps some smarter looks at things overseas. While I would love to do an alternate history of what if the UK had actually been way more proactive and immediately gotten rid of Neville so there was no appeasement whatsoever, we are going to be pursuing down the path of home defense. We've skipped forward by a lot of time. I and mean, that's precisely what actually has to happen in this scenario. Like, <laughs> I don't know what else to really say. As 1938 heads into 1939, this is pretty much where the state of the world is. The UK in this timeline is a little bit better prepared than they were in our own. Yes, everything else has fallen the exact same kind of path, but the UK perhaps in this time prepared and militarized a little bit earlier. They have a bit more aircraft, they have a bit more cover, a bit more support. They have things that are, well, going to be exceptionally useful as time moves on. Italy pursues closer bonds with Germany, and this is when war is going to break out. The question, of course, that people are going to have is, how exactly is this going to be different? What is it that we can possibly do in order to change the way that things are going to work? Well, there's a few things. First off, we know what's going to happen over here in France. Of course, the expeditionary force of Britain is going to end up being Dunkirk, and what we're going to say from this is that instead of the best and brightest, what instead probably happened in this case is that a token expeditionary force had been sent initially across, while it is that the rest of the UK was preparing. So that instead of losing the best and brightest, that perhaps it lost maybe not nearly as much. Not as many men was sent over, not as many equipment, not as much of pretty much anything. Is this far flung? Yes, yes, I know that it absolutely is, but it's all that I pretty much can do right now, okay, to justify this. 
Poland refuses the German ultimatum, war is launched, and yes, we go and join the call to arms against Germany. Of course, this is going to happen naturally as it did in our own timeline. Besides that, with the expeditionary force, things will pretty much proceed in the beginning as normal. We can say perhaps that one of the things that would end up happening is that maybe due to some better preparation, as well as some additional air power, that maybe the Germans aren't as successful on the naval front as they were in our own timeline. Either way, with war breaking out, the UK makes sure to protect the Mediterranean as much as possible. We can say that perhaps they had more efforts, that they didn't direct everything specifically towards the British Expeditionary Front because they feared that perhaps something more could happen down in the Mediterranean, which they would be right about. This period of time historically in which nothing actually happens is called the Phony War, which, yeah, it pretty much was. Nothing actually happened at that point. There would be some artillery shots fired, yes, of course, but no real major offensives would take place. Just as in our own time, in rapid order, the Netherlands would fall, followed by Belgium, and then after that, France, after which Chamberlain would resign. With the war developing to the detriment of both us and our allies, the Prime Minister has come under fire for both peacetime and wartime decisions at critical junctions, and this is where we get Winston Churchill in charge. And as Germany makes inroads into France, and France itself is getting ready to collapse, this is where the Italians would then enter and join the fray. Now, historically in our own timeline, what had specifically happened is that the Italians made initially great strides against the British down in Africa, but due to a combination of poor logistics, poor leadership, and several decisive battles, this meant that the British were able to eventually drive the Italians largely out, which in turn was fully cleansed after Operation Torch when the Americans got involved. And despite all allied efforts, and I say this here because more likely the British did not put nearly as much effort into this as they did in our own timeline, consolidating and conserving their resources, sure, we'll go with that, Paris would still fall, and in turn, so too would any hope here of trying to save France itself. That doesn't matter, that's not our goal here. With the fall of France, we're going to say that the British lost a decent number of men. Not as many as they did in our own timeline, Dunkirk would still take place, forces would still be evacuated, but they didn't lose as many tanks, guns, and equipment, and everything else. Maybe it was a more orderly retreat in this timeline. I don't know. We're just gonna say that half of them got away, isn't that right, Moonbeam? My cat came to bother me, I'm sorry. Thus with the fall of France would begin the Battle of Britain. Now, historically what happened, of course, is that the British won the Battle of Britain eventually, even despite the fact that initially they didn't have as many aircraft, it just overall wasn't as good of a situation as it possibly could be. We will say in this timeline that whether it's due to German pilots just not doing as well, more aircraft production on the British side, etc., that they had more aircraft to more decisively win the Battle of Britain faster, which in turn means less destruction of the actual British Isles. There is less bombing of London, there is less everything during the Blitz, which in turn means not nearly as much economic destruction. From that, of course... Mustache Man would have to pull back his forces in order to be able to conserve his aircraft, and would instead afterwards direct himself towards the Soviet Union, while the Italian Navy is utterly eviscerated. We can say from this time that yes, there are some losses, but ultimately what ends up occurring is that the British just absolutely wipe out the Italians. This effectively will turn the Mediterranean into an allied sea, and from that mean that the Italians, as well as the Germans, are not able to get their forces over in order to be able to reinforce. So, despite the campaign that is launched specifically against Egypt and taking out the Suez, instead the Allies are able to, very quickly, overrun Italian positions. Valuable armor that would have been lost at Dunkirk instead was able to make it over to Africa, which in turn means that the Italian forces around Tobruk are very quickly overrun. Occupation of Tangier. In a flagrant disregard of the 1924 Tangier Protocol, Spanish troops have entered the Tangier International Zone, as what can only be described as an occupation force. Yeah, uh, y y you're going to want to try to topple them normally, but the promise we're going to say is good enough now. The Spanish ambassador will say it's a temporary wartime measure, and the British won't have the forces to be able to take the fight against Spain, so yes, their promise is good enough for now. That's really all that we can do. As such, within a matter of months, almost the entirety of the Italian forces are completely wiped out and the occupation of Libya will proceed at rapid pace. Yes, there's a chance that the Germans will try to send down the Africa Corps, and this is something that could theoretically happen, and there is also the possibility that things will be more contested, so naval superiority may not immediately happen. From this, my friends, by August of 1940, we will say, only a few months into the conflict which Italy actually joins, Ethiopia has been fully freed. All Italian efforts in North Africa would have been completely wiped. In this timeline, there is significantly less suffering, there is significantly less fighting, there is significantly less everything down south, and from that, the Axis realizes that they are not going to be able to direct efforts towards the Mediterranean. They're not going to be able to push southwards. The funny thing is, if Italy at this moment decided, hey, we're going to go ahead and invade Greece and launch a strike specifically upon them, after losing as many men as they would in rapid order within Africa, this means that the British would be able to redirect their forces specifically to the mountainous passes of Greece in order to be able to help better defend it. 
it. As 1941 rolls around in this new timeline, the British position is actually significantly stronger than it otherwise would be. Failure after failure after failure to take Greece would in turn mean that Mussolini's position would become increasingly untenable. Of course, the Germans would try to send down some help, but in this case, it was the Italians' own mess to try to fix in the first place. Assuming that the Greeks are able to hold out, this would do immense amounts of damage to the Italians. But even in holding the Axis back, even in a preparation to potentially strike against Italy, this is where things would be thrown for a loop. Japan would attack the Philippines, and then from there, launch additional strikes against the UK. Wait a minute, I just realized that somehow, wait, Nor no Norway didn't fall. In, the in this timeline that I built, Norway did not fall. Huh, I wasn't actually expecting that to happen. Well, either way, even though it's later in this timeline, yes, it is here that the Germans would finally decide to strike east. They believe that they are able to knock out the Soviets, and in turn, and from this, they think from here that they will be able to secure the oil fields of the Caucasus. However, with their southern flank not nearly as protected in this new timeline, this is not exactly a smart move. So as Germany strikes its way east, it is at this point that the British would decide to strike north. As America is invited to the faction after Japan decides to strike against the Philippines, what is amazing about this new timeline is that by losing significantly less men, by not losing nearly as men in Dunkirk, and from it completely eviscerating the Italian fleet in the Mediterranean early on, this means that there is not nearly as much of a threat to specifically distract Britain from Asia. One of the key problems that Britain had in our own timeline is that they could not split the fleet. They had to constantly watch the Italians, and then after that, this allowed Japan almost free reign to be able to naval invade, take out Singapore, take out Malaysia, take out all of it. This means that though the fleet is not going to be able to contest nearly as much in the east, simultaneously what is going to end up happening is that more British forces are going to be able to hold out. Now, the thing is, despite the obvious gains that we are making here in Greece, where the enemy is literally just throwing themselves at us, which is quite stupid, we are going to say that what happens here is that the German Reich is able to rapidly advance into the Soviet Union, that they catch them completely unawares, just as they did in our own timeline, and millions of men are caught up in one go. However, they are not able to make it to Moscow by winter. They're not able to collapse the Soviet Union, just as they were not able to in our own time. With no fighting from Operation Torch necessary, American troops are able to flood across North Africa, which in turn means that by spring, even though the Germans are making rapid advances into the Soviet Union, a full year earlier is when the invasion of Italy is going to be able to take place. In rapid order, with almost all Italian forces wiped out in Africa, and simultaneously with their forces heavily distracted here in Greece, it means it is the perfect time to be able to strike against Italy itself. The Germans would naturally be forced to divert forces from Barbarossa, but... We're going to say that the Italian defenses would fall even faster than they did naturally in our own time. Though individual islands within the Philippines may fall, we're going to say from this, with additional British help, this means that the Philippines were actually able to hold their ground. Meaning the Americans never lost their forward base. In rapid order, despite German help, the Italians simply aren't able to hold. The fall of Rome will take place in 1942, a full year earlier. Naturally, the Germans would be forced to take off many of their forces off the front line in Barbarossa, which in turn would heavily slow down the assault. At this point, with how rapidly things would be taking place, it's possible that the Battle of Stalingrad would never even take place in the first place. The Germans would never manage to make it nearly as far. Within the span of merely a few months, Mussolini would be deposed, Italy would fracture into a civil war, Britain would reign supreme, and just like that, the southern belly of the German Reich would be exposed. As 1942 heads into 1943, potentially, if Italy had fallen as rapidly as it has, as Germany begins to be pushed back from the Soviet Union, France is able to be liberated. It is here then that the Yalta Conference would likely take place. With the war in Europe progressing apace, it is time for the inevitable victors to consider the future of Europe. Yes, because at this point, Germany is starting to collapse in on itself. We may propose the Soviet Union a conference of the division of the German Reich after the war to delineate our spheres of influence on the continent. Our friends in the Soviet Union have indicated that they would be interested in such a conference. No doubt they want some kind of reward for their sacrifices. By 1943, things have not gone into Japan's favor. They have not managed to take nearly as many of the islands as they had hoped. They have been struggling to take over the Dutch East Indies. The British are able to actually resist them through the isles, which just makes everything incredibly more painful for them. They do not get access to the oil or rubber that they need to fuel the war machine. Under the logic of what we've created, potentially by late 1943, going into 1944, Germany would begin to collapse in on itself. By virtue of things working out as well as they did, the only way that the British would be able to be in as strong a position as they are are now is specifically if, well, things had gone significantly better for them. <laughs> Assuming that they took significantly less losses, that the Allies were able to get in faster, that the Americans were able to hold on to the Philippines and other territory and continuously harass the Japanese so that less resources had to be spared in the East. This would be a monumental victory, one in which potentially British casualties would be half 
of what they wore in our own timeline. The economic cost, significantly less, and the empire, far more intact. So it is then, my friends, that peace comes to Europe, at least temporarily. So here it is, my friends, at the end of 1943, perhaps going into 1944, that the occupation zones are set. Unfortunately for the Polish, despite the significantly better British advance, despite the war ending a full year and a half early, the result pretty much ends up being the same. The problem is, is that by the English and others being able to take Germany from the south, by freeing Italy and by freeing France, what ends up happening is that more German forces are forced off the front line in the east, which means that the Soviets actually take less damage and are then able to move further and more rapidly west. It is arguably here that Operation Unthinkable would be able to take place, but right now, there would be a very uneasy peace. The Polish population would be furious and would demand that the English actually do something to honor their treaty and from there be able to save the Polish state. But that's not going to be able to happen. At least, not initially. First, Japan is going to have to be dealt with. And the fighting in order to be able to take out Japan, with all forces now focusing on it, would be exceptionally bloody. Seeing which way the things had turned in the Balkans, Turkey likely at some point would have decided to join the Allies, at least tentatively. With the Soviet Union now free of Germany on its west, this means in turn that they are significantly more likely in this time period to turn south. An invasion into Japan significantly earlier than they did in our own timeline would mean that the Soviets would try to establish and take over as much territory as they could, which would, in this timeline, likely severely alarm the Americans, who were busy trying to be able to take out the Japanese on their own terms. A Soviet invasion of the mainland here of Japan, and potentially a domino effect of communism rising all over the world, would be seen as a massive threat. As such, it is possible in this new timeline that Churchill would be able to convince either Roosevelt or Truman who would follow that they had to take out the Soviets, and fast. Though extremely bloody and costly, the Americans would be forced to launch their own Operation Downfall, a strike into Japan itself. The nuke would not be developed yet by this time period. With no time like the present and Japan on its last legs but fighting tooth and nail to defend itself, and with Soviet forces having been rushed heavily to the east, the six to nine months of preparation that the Allies would have on this time would would allow for everything to come to pass. The Soviet Union would be declared upon. In the initial strike, great ground would be made. Germany would be taken once again. With Soviet attention elsewhere in the east, this means that the British are able to push deep into Poland itself. The fighting would be bloody and horrendous. Copious amounts of losses would be taken, and it would be a truly bloody and terrible affair. Hundreds of thousands of men would die, specifically turning on their former allies. Morale from this would likely plummet, as the men would wonder why it is that they were fighting the men that they had actually helped them win. The Soviets in this time would not have taken nearly as much damage from the Germans as they did in our own. Likely as it is, hundreds of thousands, millions of Soviets would be alive that weren't in our own time, as the Germans never would have been able to push as far as they did. Potentially within the span of six months, Poland would be liberated, but manpower at this point would be running low. The British public would be exhausted. A peace deal would likely be offered to Stalin. His answer? Go to hell. The idea of, in this scenario, of a quick victory being able to knock out the Soviets and then from there force them to come to the negotiation table to get them to back off of Europe is unlikely to work. Going into 1945, this is where the United States would develop the nuke, except instead of using it on Japan, they would then have the opportunity to use this on the Soviet Union. Except, of course, Soviet aviation and capabilities was going to be significantly greater than anything that Japan was going to be able to do. So, the idea of its bombers being able to reach deep into the Soviet Union to nuke them is... Unlikely. The nukes would likely be able to only be used on local cities. Minsk, Gomel, Kiev, others. And despite the destructive capabilities, Soviet Union would still likely not surrender. In this timeline, Germany was beaten much earlier. Soviet Union was able to preserve much of its industry. Its people, though bloody, were not nearly as scarred as they were in our own time. From that, the war would effectively turn into some kind of stalemate, gradually grinding each other down as total war wrecked hell across the entire continent. In the subsequent fighting, millions would likely die. Famine would spread across the land, and eventually, some kind of peace settlement would have to occur. Chances are, after dropping enough nukes, that the Soviet Union would be willing to come to the negotiation table. Perhaps after that, they lose some of their territory, such as the Soviet-occupied section of Germany and sections of Poland, but others are likely allowed to maintain. The initial territory they took when dividing Poland with Germany would likely be allowed to stay with them. The remainder would be left as a kind of free, small Polish state, a buffer to the Soviets, if you will. The Soviets would never forget their humiliation that would come from this, even after the grand victory. Every effort would be undertaken specifically to gain access to nukes. And after that, 
the Soviet Union would likely be far more willing to use them on their Western counterparts in order to be able to secure their future. The result of this would be not only hostility and mistrust, but outright hatred and a desire for annihilation. And the world itself would likely suffer from it. Perhaps I'm being dramatic in the end. But my friends, this is the most likely result. Something in which no one wins when Operation Unthinkable is launched. With that, I think that we're going to be ending things here today. My friends, thank you all very much for watching. I appreciate all of you, and I will see you all here next time. I am exhausted. I have had to record this for the last, like, eight hours in order to try and make this because of how long this thing is. Thank you all for watching. Thank you all for your support. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and put your suggestions for another alternate history down in the comment section below. I need to go rest. I have been filming for a long time today.